Okay, and we are recording. So yeah, over to you, Scott. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, can everyone see the screen? Yeah. Yes. Brilliant, 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 brilliant. Okay. Uh, yeah, really excited to come along here today to do this talk. Um, really because you know this was part this was part of the uh, Lean Agile Global and. Uh, you know, a big thanks to Jose and uh, you know, Ahmad for organizing that. Uh, C-Prime, really proud to be a sponsor of that. It's a great initiative. It brings people around the world. The inclusion and diversity and the speaker list is just, is just amazing. And it's the right kind of event that we need. It's very inclusive, very open, and you've set a great culture there, Jose. So uh, thank you very much. C-Prime, are proud to be supporters. Okay, um, and let's let's move forward. I'll, I'd like to introduce Adam first of all. I, I met Adam about a year ago. I think it might be about a year because I think I got an email from Brian today about anniversaries. Um, so yeah, about a year ago, I left the finance sector. Um, Adam and I knew a lot of mutual people, and um, Adam was looking for someone to come on board at. Um, at a large pharmaceutical company and uh, Adam and I hit it off immediately. We work with another uh, person in our trio who's uh, US based and the three of us just have an absolute hoot. We're all completely different. Um, Adam is uh, you know, Adam's very knowledgeable. He's, uh, he's also very good at um, exec C-suite engagement. He's able to put these kind of hard context into that Yorkshire grit kind of way that, you know, you do know your money should be making money. You know? <laughs> You do know that you need to be focusing on uh, on value. Um, Adam's also, you know, very uh, a great trainer. I've learned a lot from him and the way he presents, uh, you know, in, the information. He's, uh, you know, he does a, you know, lots of training within the within the safe suite, and he's also um, working very closely just now with uh, with RadTAC. And we'll talk a little bit about that. There's a lot of people on the call with RadTAC connections. Uh, uh, but yeah, that, I mean, that's Adam, a uh, great coach, great consultant, uh, happy to work with him anywhere. Been a great, great finder last year was finding Adam. Scott, thank you very much. Uh, it, it was like a perfect storm that we ended together. You know, normally our past shouldn't meet, but due to COVID, IL-35 and lots of other things, we did end together. I mean, how do I introduce Scott? You know, I, I put it on the slide. You, pretty much a famous coach. And what does that mean? I think a great litmus test of this is anytime we reference anyone else, ask, does Scott them have, have them on Facebook? Are they in WhatsApp? And chances are the answer is going to be yes. You only gain those connections through credibility and authenticity. I think authenticity is really what Scott has brought to the party. You know, me working with him in the last 12 months has just been fantastic. He's really sort of you know, set the stage on sort of you know, I, I was contract for a decade. So as I like any contract coach, I think I'm fantastic. And it's really sort of brought it together on actually where are we? And, you know, holistically we improve. And I think that's Scott sort of genius. You know, his Agile Reflect conference that he did, uh, that I, he has just been nominated for an award. How you manage that with the engagement that you do on a shoestring budget, you know, any of the big conference companies or frameworks would, We'll be glad for half of that at sort of 10 times the cost. It's a, a true reflection, I think, on Scott's value add, not as a coach, but also what's given back to the community. And this is, what, this is what this whole thing's about. You know, this is what we like about meetups. Okay, it's virtual. No one likes virtual as much as, you know, being in the pub or the coffee house doing this. Uh, but this is the value add. We as a community, we talk about things, we discuss, and collectively, you know, we go from here to here, to here. And that's what's great uh, about sort of the, the Agile sphere. Okay, let's uh, let's move forward. Adam. Okay, if you just skip or through all our animations and get to the, uh, the whole slide, please. Okay, we've had to put pretty pictures of who's saying what on the top, uh, just to remind ourselves, because Scott does get carried away and he does like to talk quite a bit, but this one's mine. It's got a picture on it, I mean, it's my slide. Uh, Perez talks about you know, the trans transformational technology revolutions that we've been through before. 
There are things like the uh, Canal Mania, obviously quite relevant to where I am in Yorkshire, through to the Industrial Revolution, how the age of steam brought uh, goods and people to the big mills and got the Victorian Revolution off the back of that how we got to the heavy age of uh, engineering and steel so we could you know, build bigger things and more substantial that would last, that would shorten the horizons across the globe. We capitalised this on the age of oil and mass production post-war period. But where are we now? Okay, we've had the dot-com bubble bust. Uh, we've had recession, we've had a housing boom and crash, we've had COVID. Uh, Perez always talks about you know, three, there should be three catalysts to a turning point. And the question is, you know, where are we and where are organisations within that turning point? Have we got to the other side? Where is the finance, where is the money going? Is it going that installation period to fund the things that we want to capitalize on? The infrastructure, the engineering practices, uh, whatever that may be. Or are we actually funding the production and the deployment of that? Are we now capitalizing on this digital revolution? Ultimately, we don't know. You know we need a benchmark. And this is what these agility health, health checks can bring. You know, whether it's a safe one, whether it's your own, we need some sort of point to assess how are we doing and ultimately the deltas from that. Scott, next slide. Oh, me again, I've got another pretty picture. At SAFE did change their uh, business self-assessment. It was quite deep in the safe language and i know you know you love safe you hate safe it's a very good topic on twitter you have to have a good base understanding or a decent spc to sort of even read the questions you know, so much was lost in translating the questions you know what is an art what do they mean by a value stream they stripped that all back and made it a lot simpler and fair play to safe for doing this uh, they did make this now sort of accessible to anyone. You know, we have 22 questions that's agnostic of framework. It's in simple day-to-day -day language that we all understand. So anyone can do it, which is really good. I used to be a developer. So having you know, 43 or, or lots of, so 22 data points was great. You know, fidelity is great. Actually, how do you play that back? I think... The, the good thing is the simplicity of it. You know, by stripping it back to just the six competencies inputted via Excel, as you can see on the bottom, there's nothing fancy about this. But you know, the good point is the simplicity. We can see on a graph you have six areas uh, to grow. You know, it's, it's no good being really, really good in one of the twenty two. It kind of gets lost in translation a bit. So I think by taking what is probably a brave decision to strip all the, all the skilled agile terminology out of it, to simplify it, that has made it accessible, which means people are gonna do it. And to be fair, they're probably gonna do it a little bit more honesty, uh, honestly. And this is what we want from agility assessments. Me again. So what, are we actually going to measure? Oh, yours. I've, I've added your face. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering that. I was wondering at me. It also <laughs> com comes down to three things. We want to get good stuff out the door quicker at a more efficient rate. Obviously, saying that in a soundbite is easy, but that could take a decade. You know, we have clients where end to end, from ideation to getting a dollar return on this is over a decade. These are very, very long time scales. You know, we're not trying to get things in some cases down to two weeks or six months or a very short MVP, but even in something as a decade, you yeah. can get that, if you get, can get that down to nine and a half years, mm -hmm. that's gonna be good. That's gonna be really, really good. As with most things, it's not about you know, being quick yourself. You just need to be quicker than your competitors. Be the first to the patent office, the first to the copyright. 
So flow is really important. Likewise with competency, you know, how proficient is your organization in enabling business agility? Are you doing it through a really hard struggle? Is it always 60, 70 hour weeks? Are you starting to build that internal competency that's gonna help to decrease your flow? And then ultimately, very simplistically, does the solution meet the needs of your clients, the customers, the business, people that are going to use it? As simple as that, are we building a solution, a product offering that people are going to want, use, and hopefully come back for? Now, these are things that we want to try and capture in a business agility assessment. So okay. I'll, I'll talk for a little I'll, I'll talk for a little bit on the yellow ones and then you can give you a bit of a rest then you can come on at the blue ones um, perfect this is the this is one of the safe diagrams that we use um, and it's on it's online it's available and the beauty of it is uh, these are you know on the website click any of these and you get the definition it, it goes into like you know longer term definitions these relate to the the sectors in the new um, assessment so if you've got uh, you know an element in the assessment you'd like to know a little bit more about it you know you, you can click into here so take lean portfolio management you can click into here it'll give you the definitions you can click below that you'll get even more understanding and i think that that beauty of the new assessment directly relating to this and the structure of the websites is much more powerful than the old one um and and the other thing is uh, you know it's just it's just it's just a more simple logical setting so i'm going to talk about the ones at the side so lean portfolio management. Uh, so that's that's really like the the portfolio level. If you're from a kind of Kanban background, you'll you know you'll understand flight levels and things like that. So this is the this is the level of an organization or that should be thinking about the, the work that's coming up. Um, it's very much Kanban based and safe, um, which I'm sure Jose will be happy to hear. And uh, it's uh, you know we're, hope, we're we're trying to get concepts like next cab off the rank there and and, and other things where. You know the, the work's coming down in, in more of a pooled way um but we're finding a lot of organizations uh, it might be great with their agility at the team level but when it actually comes to flowing work and having work um analyzed and hypothesized it, it's just not there so, so that's another a, a key measure um the next one there's organizational agility and the organizational agility one you know really looks into um how well your informal and formal networks are working um, so we're gonna have, we can have formal networks and they and they're quite good for things like um, professional uh, development. But are we using community practices? Are we setting up um, you know like teams that can make decisions quickly as well? Because if we refer everything back to the formal structure, and that, that's what the logos around about there. Um, and this comes from a lot of the thinking in here has came from um, a, a great person that I you know I followed for years, probably twenty years, and that's Cotter. Um, and Cotter's book Accelerate. Um, that was one of the best books that came out about 10 years ago, and I was an early kind of proponent of the book. And this is concept of you need to have a formal structure and an informal structure, and how well that that flows that in organizational decision making is really important. Um, I think Alistair Coburn talks about the speed of decision making as a real indicator, a great KPI in an organization. So just what is your agility um, there? Uh, the second thing is continuous learning culture. So that goes back to Peter Senge and um, you know, the whole idea of the fifth, this yeah, the fifth discipline, the, the the idea of are you a learning culture? Again, we're finding cultures that are you know really under the cost for delivery that never have time to take time to learn. Um, you know, never you know, a lot of attendance at community practices and guilds. Maybe the structure is there. Maybe they're using the Spotify model, but the guilds aren't well, um, well, um, uh, what's the word? Um, utilize because people are always just too busy working so again how well are you getting that continuous learning culture um, and that's another that, and that's one of the other key metrics um I'll, I'll take the central one and then you could take the leadership one adam uh, but the central one is customer centricity so again we're we're meeting lots of teams and large organizations that that wouldn't know a customer base if they tripped over it yeah, they don't do any research. They don't do any, you know, they're delivering to a product owner who's a business owner who's, you know, working somewhere. So, so even like the basic concepts, uh, you know, around about, you know, just just focusing on what the customer needs, which which you could 
which you can do if you're doing like a kind of a lean startup approach and you're a small company, it's just alien to large companies. So again, another useful measure. And I'll hand over to you for the, the other ones, Adam. Thank you, Scott. So lean, agile leadership, pretty straightforward. How do we move from that fixed mindset to a flexible growth mindset? How do we as leaders drive in change? How do we be authentic? How are we ut utilizing things like emotional intelligence? You know, gone are the, are the days where I need to show my management prowess by being in control and micromanaging all 100, 1,000, 10,000 people that I was responsible for. That's not quite the paradigm that we are going for. The whole point is to be a lifelong learner whilst growing others. So what I don't want is you know, one of me and 10,000 others. What I want is you know, 10,000 little agile leaders, you know, all aligned, all growing together. And also we use decentralized, decentralizing decision-making as a catalyst for this. The team and tech and agility, all we're saying here is get back to the basics. Regardless of the size of the organization, it doesn't matter. It's all a team of teams models. If you don't understand the basics of good code, good engineering, simple XP practices, then you're just going to scale bad practices. It's really vital that we understand how to do that. And then we're utilizing that in agile product delivery to build things that people are going to want. As Adam, Scott said, yes. I have a question. How would you deal with that in the circumstance of a large company like uh, Vodafone or T-Mobile, et cetera? Because I come from that, I am, I come from Deutsche Telekom and I'm a scrum master there. And we're obviously implementing scaled agile at this point in time. We're implementing obviously, or trying to do more and more design thinking, but obviously the complexity of our organization isn't just um, on one layer, because obviously we've got multiple components to our, we've got our fixed network, mo uh, mobile network and so on plus on top of that marketing and, and, and. So the complexity we have is we have gotten rid of all our management, middle management, our SVPs, and we've actually replaced them with chapter leads and people leads, et cetera. So their their aim is different, but we're still obviously in this, 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 this discussion about COPs and uh, guilds. So how would we, how would you suggest we go forward with that? I mean, obviously that, that's a very broad, far reaching question. Uh, apart from the obvious of getting really good coaching consultancy to assist you on that. Uh, I mean, really enough, we are working with large telecoms inside Europe. Uh, I mean, if you have stripped out your middle management, you're sort of halfway there. If you're looking at community of practices and the horizontal alignment, then I assume you're doing that through some sort of lace or LPM function or agile PMO function, uh, which again is, is the right way to do it. What was the, what was the exact question? What, what's the sort of tangible thing that you're trying to the, answer? The on tangible this? component is obviously we are aiming towards customer centric. Our, the complexity is with the lean agile leadership and obviously the organizational agility, because obviously in, We've actually, okay, I, I'll give you a, a fixed uh, example. I'm in fiber optics. So I'm a scrum master for our, our fiber optics team. Um, we've brought down our delivery from nine months to six weeks. Now, obviously, our next objective is to bring it down even further, down to two weeks. Uh, we're using AI and different technologies. Um, we're also looking at using the 80-20 concept of 20% of innovation, 80% uh, delivery, but that's easy on the the application on the system, uh, sorry, on the uh, team level, the complexity is more on the level of of the upper management and the investment, obviously, and that level upwards. They are, let's say, still stuck on things like the budgeting and OPEX, CAPEX concept, rather than looking at uh, like per pip, what we're delivering, our, our complex, our capabilities and so on. So that's the aspect that's missing currently. So what we want to okay. do, what I'm looking for is uh, some kind of um, idea on how to deal with the organization, organizational agility on a, uh, an upper level uh, to support even that drive faster. No, that's, that's a really good point. It is always the finance and how we fund these things that, that come to last. You know, traditionally, 
I have two buckets, capex, opex. They're static for 12 months. I have to spend them all in one go. So things like beyond budgeting, you try and do incremental right. funding. You know, if you're doing safe, aligned with a PI, uh, uh, Luke Hoffman, uh, Luke Hoffman, is that right, Scott Hoffman? Hoffman. Let's get his surname. Hoffman, sorry, apologies. Uh, does some really good work on this. Scott knows him personally, I think, as well. Only, um, only through but, Horsley and Ahmad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I'd, I'd look into his beyond budgeting. Uh, he does a really good simulation, uh, which is great for C-suites to sort of highlight this. Mm. Uh, that with capacity planning is always a good thing. So like you said, 80-20, what, what your allocation is, uh, that forces you to spend on innovation. It forces you to spend money, hopefully focus on the customer in order to get a better product that's going to get better returns. Uh, but mm -hmm. I think a nice sort of quick win would be looking at beyond budgeting uh, and uh, Luke that's Hoffman's work the as well. Right now, that's that's the biggest challenge right now. It's you, you've got to jump into it. There's no sort of way around it, unfortunately, when it comes to this. Uh, the finance again, it's always the last bit when we talk about a dual operating yep. system and bringing people in. You know, governance, HR, legal. We know how to do that, but the budgeting, it, it, it is the last thing we do. Uh, it's the hardest. You know, how do you move from annual budgets to three month right. rolling budgets? Uh, but you, you, you've got to give it a go, I'm afraid. Scott, anything okay. to add to Stuart? Um, I, think, I think the key bit there is, you know, when you're talking about the lean agile leadership, I, sometimes when I meet leaders, it's like agile is something that other people do that makes their business more efficient and they don't have to show up to do anything. Right. Um, so again, you know, um, the leadership. And the other thing is, once upon a time, leaders could be distant from the work. And now that there isn't a middle management, they need to be much more involved and close. Um, so I think the development of value streams, I think aligning the services to value streams to give ownership, and that ownership is then very related to uh, like the, you know, short cycles, but also accountability and feedback. Mm -hmm. um, I think that makes it's, it's almost like if, if we were flying a plane, right, we've suddenly taken a lot of layers out and the person flying the plane is feeling the response from the organization more. Yeah, yeah. it's the flight levels. There's a, there's a difference on the flight level, of co coordination, yeah. portfolio, and so on. Yeah. I mean, the, Scott, if I take that from that aspect, you're right, but the problem, I work for a German company, okay? So the cultural aspect is, very much different from what you would normally get on, let's say, a London-based company, for instance. The mentality, I mean, if I look at my US colleagues, I look at the European colleagues, I look at my Singaporean colleagues, there is obviously a huge aspect difference in, in all those components. So um, the from, but from Tim, Tim Hudke's point of view, he is really bought into this and it is driving it as a big aspect of it. The the, the, the value streams obviously are understood because that's why we've sp we're spending a billion euros this year just on fiber optics, just to bring it up to speed. But at the same time, it's, um, as, 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 Scott, uh, as you said, Adam said, I mean, it's this- I tell, this I, I tell, what, we can, I tell what we can, I tell what we can screw. Stuart, I tell you what yeah. we do. We've got a lot of material to no, get through, right? Sorry, I'll shut no, up. No, 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 what would be really good is contact Adam and I afterwards, Okay. Well, do. To do the business agility. I'd love to see how you rate your organization, and we could have a okay. we could have a conversation about that. Sure. Yeah. We'll do. Yep. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. It could be you score quite mature here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, that'd be quite good, Stuart. Because we do have experience with certain German telecoms as well, and yes, the culture is a good part. Uh, sure. Okay. okay. So we're, we're thanks, worried. guys. So yeah, sure. not a problem. So we need to build something that's desirable, that's feasible, that's viable. Standard stuff, and that's what we mean by agile product delivery. Then, interesting thing: how do we build the really, really big things? How do you build a satellite, a plane, tank, you know, anything like that, involving huge lots of people, multiple suppliers? Something that's going to continuously evolve. You know, we don't want to put a product live, and then that's it. It's set in its state for eternity. How do we do over there updates, live updates to our product, our solution offering? And that's what we cover off in the enterprise solution delivery. Excellent. Um, 
yeah also in the chat i just put culture maps um you can actually do an online culture map assessment between your different cult country cultures and that might be another uh, another useful thing stuart um, okay uh right so this is me who does the assessment uh now, now this is really really important okay so what we're trying not to do is make this a performance thing so let's say you're a large organization with multiple divisions what we don't want is a chief executive saying do the assessment and when i see the results you know that'll affect your bonuses or something so we almost want this to be um you know evenly applied but not part of any performance metrics um and and that's that can be a little bit difficult sometimes you need to develop a bit of trust before teams will do it the self-assessment part is really good uh, but we have sometimes got problems with some programs scoring themselves high and this is on any assessment anywhere um uh, or high or, or low and there's a kind of odd correlation that sometimes better teams score themselves low and uh you know worse teams score themselves high so this is why probably one of your better options is to actually have this facilitated um and 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 not even just facilitated, but have the ability to probe and ask some questions in some context. Uh, uh, one of the other people we work with is uh, Brandon Hill Jowett. Brandon Hill Jowett came up with a nice mate, uh, you know, within, within a nice assessment, but he always maintains that that needs to be facilitated, there needs to be probing questions just to try and get that, that level of honesty. Um, and, uh, and, and the other thing is language and wording as well, if you're doing any assessments and try and get people to think about the whole organization, the whole part of the organization they're in and not themselves and get the widest amount of views. So don't, not just technical people, but everyone, business people as well. Um, so, so really try and get that overview um, and, and definitely don't make it a performance, uh, a performance thing. Uh, ways to mess up doing the assessment. Um, yeah, so we, we talked about the performance. Deming in the lean side of obviously says drive fear out. I don't think we've driven fear out of large organizations. In fact, as coaches, I think we all, everyone on this call spends time trying to create courage. And this is probably why it's a scrum value. Uh, again, don't rank and stank. Uh, stank? Rank and stank. I like that. Don't, don't rank, it, uh, rank and stack the divisions. Don't have different areas listed in one place. Um, so there's any comparison because we're not using this as a comparison tool. We're not using this to beat people up. Um, it's a, you know, and again, it's facilitating, not coaching. So, you know, it's not putting your opinions or your views of what you think the situation is. It's trying to, it's trying to bring out that, you know, that, 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 that kind of almost like self-learning, uh, don't rush it. Um, I've seen myself take it um you know leave it with people for a while so they can get familiar ask themselves some questions and get comfortable um what well, one thing not to do is say monday morning we want every division to do this assessment and we want the results on my desk by tuesday uh, that that will just you know put too much kind of fear into it um and, and again you know really look for biases in the outcomes um uh, yeah yeah that, that's really it the findings adam okay so we've done the assessment what do we do as scott said this isn't always about you know beating ourselves up trying to find someone to a reason to hit someone with a stick we need to celebrate the good things we are doing i mean stuart raised a good point about finance and we're not quite doing it right but you know what if your only problem is you're not moving to rolling budgets that's a very very nice problem to have so we just celebrate the other good things that we are doing. You know, we're excelling in giving a good product. We're great at a team level. We have the right sort of leadership. You know what? Our LPM is probably not quite where we need it to be. It's really important that we celebrate success. Because once we do that, you know, that's going to be contagious. People love that. Scott also talked about you know, delegating and things like that. We need the appropriate audience. You can do uh, these self-assessments at most levels, obviously not at a team level, because we have a team and technical agility assessment for that. They really get down to the details, but at a, at a program, at a portfolio level, at a business area, you need the right stakeholders there. These shouldn't be thrown away. It's not a case if we do this once, you know, with some sort of twisted agenda to highlight a point or hide a failing. We should be doing these at a regular cadence. Because again, we want to celebrate the success we're doing. We want to highlight the deltas, show where our investment 
uh, on innovation and improvement is actually going. Yes, it uses an Excel spreadsheet, not the most advanced of things, but it's simple and it works. That said, you know, any half decent enterprise hopefully has some dashboarding software, whether it's Power BI, uh, Cabana, whatever it is. If you can import this into that, and there are a few third parties that do this, we'll talk about this later. That's a great way to share this information, to compare and contrast. We see not only internally for your different portfolios or different business areas, but if you're brave enough, have a little peek outside. How is your competitors doing? Do you know how your competitors are doing? Do you know how uh, other markets are doing? Where do you need to be? That's important because it's not the case that you need to be five on everything. That would be fantastic. But if the average in your sector is two, all you need to be is a three. You know, that's a good place to be. And then where else do you need to focus on it in order to grow? Okay, I'll, this is another interesting thing. Your organization and your business is a very complex adaptive system. And what we're really doing is saying the six measures here. Okay. Now, this is a, you know, if you look at, regulation everything else in there is it, it, it there's a great complexity so so the point of this slide is is to say just remember that your results are are an indication yeah what's actually happening in your organization is much more complex um so so don't think that um you're making changes and nothing's happening with the results um that's a bad thing it could be that this very complex organization takes a lot of a a lot of change to make something happen it could be that you make a lot of change and uh, your organizational results go down. So, well, you know, don't worry. Sometimes if you're going through change, you're not actually delivering because you're doing improvement and change that might make some of these, uh, these factors change as well. So it's, it's just understanding that this is a very, very simple measure. It's a bit like your temperature. Yeah, I take my, I had a bit of a flu last night. So my temperature went up, that's just one measure. But my human body is one of the most complex things on the planet. One measure doesn't, doesn't describe the system. So you need to also understand the system. Um, the other, yeah, you know, the other thing that anyone who's looking at any of these measures and wants to try and change their organization, yeah, you know, needs to take on board. Well, how do I, uh, yeah, I can't just shout and say, you know, get better, you know, lean portfolio. I need to understand the barriers there. I need to empower people. Yeah, I need to make sure there's more connectivity happening. I need to develop trust. I need to develop. Um, you know, kind of more shaping our organization, continual learning and co-evolution. Why do I put these here? It may be that your results go down, but you're actually getting better. And that's because your initial results were a bit um, unrelated to the truth, or you didn't know that much about things. So now you're actually more trusting and more open and understanding. Um, I have seen, I have seen, you know, results go down, but that's just, it's almost like normalizing back to actuality away from uh, a little bit more of a, um, a kind of a hopeful state that you might be you know, recording these in. Um, okay, Adam. Okay, so is this going to let me draw on the slide? It's hard to look. Okay, so we've got everything we need here. We've done the results. Fantastic. What do we do next? Well, we want to improve, but where does improvement, where does innovation happen? Is it a case that we do it before nine o'clock? Do we do it after five o'clock? Do we do it on a Sunday? You know, this really needs to be built in. I mean, Stuart made an excellent point that they're trying to bake innovation, you know, by something as simple as capacity planning into what they do. You know, as a good learning organization, we need to factor this in. This should be part of the 40 hour week. In order to do that, we need to make it tangible. So say here you want to excel in organizational agility. Okay, that's great, but we need to do something with it. How do we turn a tacit into tangible? There we go, so we can see it. You know, this is the delta here that we're trying to address. Well, we have a think, we come up with some ideas. Okay, and ideas work, where does it go? It goes in the backlog. So go in the backlog, and so get prioritized just like anything else. Within SAFE, I always talk to our, our product people and we stress this on the APM course that we're doing this week, I want to click. It's about relentless prioritization. Again, innovation doesn't happen on weekends. Business change does not happen on weekends. We need to make a trade-off. 
So either we get the shiny new feature appear, or we invest in our program, in our people, you know, to be authentic, lean, agile leaders. But maybe investing in virtualization, maybe investing in rolling budgets. Whatever it is, at, at whatever level, whether it's a, a new virtual data center, whether it's a little bit of unit test training, it goes in the appropriate backlog whether it's at a portfolio program or at a team level. We turn a tacit to the tangible so we can see it, we can talk about it. And then hopefully the bottom left where we have a very simple capacity budget, we can budget for it. If we allocate 10, 15, 20, 30% of our allocation towards it, we have that spend on. It will get prioritized along with everything else. And that's really good. We see it all the time at team level, tech debt pushed to the bottom. In essence, that's what we're doing with the organizations. There's nothing stopping us. We, we, have the, we have the people, we have the knowledge workers, we have the skill set to do it, but you know, too many of the urgent. It just gets pushed down to the bottom and it never gets addressed. By putting it in the backlog, it will force us to make those choices. And at least then they'll be transparent and we will be able to see, you know what? For this three months, for this PI, we decided to deprioritize innovation or learnings. And then there's no argument over it. You can carry on now. Well. Excellent. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so I think another thing here is this is this is the this is for the coaches who are who are kind of using the business agility. Um, we don't use the business agility thing to say, well, we need more coaching or more training courses or, or, or sell things like that. The an sometimes the answer to everything in agile is that, you know, we need more coaching, right? And again, we're not, we're not pushing the coaching. We're pushing understanding the system and getting organizations to get out of their comfort zone. So, you know, and, and I like this diagram for comfort zones. Um, so organizations and most of the organizations I've been in the last 12 years, um, are very comfortable where they're at. They know that the world's scary and they want to get there. Um, and when there's a there's an agility movement coming forward, or when we say let's fill in the business agility thing, uh, they go into the fear zone. Yeah. And that's when you might get the business agility thing scored a little bit higher than than it is because they think it's part of the performance. They think they'll be punished by results and things. So uh, what we really need to get people in, into is more of the learning zone. So we really need to position this as your tool to help you assess you. We'll help come along and um, you know support you in what you want to do based on that. But you need to be the leaders who understand how to use these things and understand how your business works and understand your complex adaptive system. And then once once we've established that learning zone, and some of it might be as Adam says, guardrails over protecting innovation and learning and other you know valuable things that teams aren't doing because they're getting squashed out for a feature factory. Um, then they can actually get into the growth zone. I posit, right, and we can talk about it at the end, but organizations that are in the comfort zone or in the fear zone are not really going to be here in about 50 years time. Um, COVID moves things forward 10 years. You've seen the companies that have thrived in COVID and the ones that have struggled in COVID. Um, and they're the ones that are definitely in the learning and the growth zone. And they're the, and, and that's where these things are promoted. Um, so I put that up there just to say, look, this agility measurement is great. This coaching is great. But as an organization, you really do need to you know, stop fearing the end of your company and start setting the things up to, to change. And, and one of the biggest things I see about company fear in the end of the company is they immediately go and take 15% of costs out or offshore everything to, um, you know, to a time zone that's 12 hours away. Uh, none of that's going to help you with your speed of innovation. None of that's going to help you with your future. But it's the kind of thing that happens in fear zone. Yeah. Oh. Adam? Perfect. So I've lost the title. Okay, so what's it cost? Can we put a price on innovation? Uh, we actually can. I mean, okay, do you want to segregate it out for your capex, for your opex, depending on who's doing it? Capacity planning is really good at this. You know, if we are doing safe or any other framework where we have persistent teams, and persistent teams is really the key, we know roughly that we're going to have a fixed cost. And then simply, it's where do you want to turn that dial? Now, if you're burning, let's say, 10 million every three months for a large program, 
how much of that do you want to dedicate to innovation learning to move your organization forward you know out to the tipping point into that deployment period as Perez talks about everything's tangible there's no soft tacit things that we're sort of doing over there and sort of doing our day job everything is in our backlog which is really important we need these to be tangible so we can point we can prioritize we can ask questions you know, not every great innovation idea is probably going to get carried through uh, the organization. You want to try it, see if it works. If it doesn't, that's fine. Like everything, a backlog, it's not a list of what we are going to do. It's just potential work. So capacity planning is really important in, in that. And yes, we can put a, a value on it. And also, if we're doing these assessments on a regular cadence, we should be able to see our deltas hopefully they'll, they'll improve so if you go from a two to a three to a five in a certain sector then yes you can work out what the aggregate cost of that is and hopefully you can work out with your, your kpis okrs your leading indicators was it worth it was that money well spent if it if it is great let's ride this riptide of innovation what if it's not fantastic let's pivot and let's spend that money elsewhere on something else that's in the backlog So I did mention this earlier, you know, what do we do once we've got this? Where do we look? Be brave, look at your competitors. You know, it's very important, especially with the uh, COVID and remote working and the way that what we thought was the norm has all been turned on its head over the last two years. I suppose be quite honest and open in that you're gonna get some hard truths. You know, you're not going to be excellent at everything. Who would have thought? But it's important that we are transparent, that key value, right down the basic team level. We need to have that flowing throughout the organization. And not only look at your direct segment, but look at other companies as well. You know, it's not the case that one company just makes phones or just makes cars. We're seeing these huge tech companies just blur the lines. Actually, what does a tech company do? You know, there's no differentiator now that, yes, you used to make phones, that's it. You only make phones. You know, Apple is the biggest producer of watches. It's ridiculous where things are going. We don't know where it's going to be in the future. So certainly don't just look at your company and don't even just limit it to your market sector. You know, look at the other companies both within your region, whether it's a FTSE 250, Fortune 500, or something out within Asia. It's really important. That, I, I'm just gonna build on that point, Adam. Um, I, when I was in finance, right? Anyone in finance wanted to know what other finance companies were doing. So this agility is great, but where's your finance example? Yeah. Uh, when I'm in pharma, it's like, this agility is great. Where's your pharma example, okay? What we know is the greatest break step innovations and the greatest change comes from adjacent technologies and fields. So it's when you take something out of telecoms and you apply it into finance, yeah, or you take something out of um, healthcare and you put it into pharma and you suddenly get, you know, great boosts and things. So, so this, this kind of inside thinking in, in communities, I think, I, I think is really holding people up as well. I, I don't know what you think about that. No, I completely agree. Just look at the recent space race, you know, that we've been seeing in the US. It's not you know, Lockheed Martin or companies like that. Uh, one of the guys makes cars, other used to sell books. You know, how, is, how is it a case that these companies have grown from that into racing themselves to send rockets into space? Yes, it helps that they have billions of dollars, but so do the US government, and they haven't been doing too great on, on this recently. So I think the fresh attitudes that we're seeing, uh, these sort of the pivots that a lot of these companies are taking, uh, I think it's encouraging. Which leads on to the next point. You know, just because you don't, you might not like what you see, don't shy away from it. I mean, Scott talked about fear, and again, as leaders in a company, it's not something that we talk about. If we express fear, are we expressing our vulnerability? And we don't want that, do we? You know, I'm a leader. I need to be strict, control, you know, Taylorism, things like that. A vulnerability, if you looked at any of the Bernie Brown books, really, really powerful. And that's what it takes to look inside. You know what? We're good at some things, but equally, these things we aren't. But at least now, we have the opportunity to act. 
and you can guarantee you know your peers are doing the same thing so utilize uh, the skilled agile forums you know these are really powerful it's also free which is quite good nowadays all your peers in the same sectors across the globe whether you're an spc and rte scum master regardless of what you're doing uh, even hr now and marketing you know, we have forms for those utilize those ask for help and uh, i did mention that currently yes we're using uh, excel spreadsheet to do this you know, it's not the most sexy of things when it's uh, played back agility health comparative agile uh, great tools as well if you want to use something online or cloud offering that will present and aggregate more more pretty ways of playing this back yeah and i think that at the moment uh, business agility institute are collecting around the world um you know up there 2021 uh, version so you can actually go back uh, i think it started at 2019 so you can actually see the trends um and and the analysis and they did i think um agility health do a lot of the analysis on that so it's you know it, it is a good survey to get involved in yeah okay um and yeah so, so this came from a safe conference uh where they actually looked at the uh, you know the um in the conference, he did some benchmarking across the conference. It was, it was in 2019. I think at the end of this, we're going to have a conversation about where could we do this and what could we improve. So this was, you know, a one event at the conference where we actually, you know, looked at how the the general conference was doing. I think I think it's just great to see the comparators and things. So team and technical agility. You know, the teams at the conference seem to think that they were further on in that. So you know, we're at we walk. And this is coming from the Business Agility Institute's terms of, you know, um, sit, walk, crawl, run, fly. Yeah. But interestingly, even at that, you know, even in that whole setting, you know, nobody's really, um, nobody's really flying in terms of agility. And that's a whole conference. That's every organization doing agility that's at the summit. Um, so again, I think if we could see more of these things as well, you could benchmark where you are at and, 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 you know, and with it. Uh, but very early days. I'd, I'd love to see this done again. I think COVID stopped it getting done in 2020 because the conference didn't happen. Uh, but had it happened, we could have some more data. So again, reinforcing Adam's point that you know the more data points we're getting this, then the, you know the easier it is to see where we're at. Um, but yeah, I mean, look at this portfolio. Everyone's scoring very low on that. Um, leadership, everyone's scoring very low on that. Um, yeah, organizational agility, everyone's scoring very low on that. And this is, you know, I'd love to see this cut by sector as well, but, um, but we'll talk about that at the end. Okay, um, Adam, yeah, how, how frequently should we do them? Um, so again, I, I, I really fought maturity assessments quite hard when I first got them back in, when I was working at RadTech at, uh, at a large um, institute. Because what they were doing was they were using those performance measures on the agile transformation. Um, but in, in doing it this way as, as a team assessment and what they're doing, especially in large teams, divisions, um, art, you know, agile release trains and things, uh, you know, looking, looking at how this works and that, um, yeah, not doing them, you know, not doing them at a very low level because large organizational change is very is glacial. It takes a long time to change. So you'd be checking you be taking a picture of the glacier every 10 hours and it's not moving. But if you take a picture every three months, you'll see it moving. Um, so, you know, it, within SAFE, there's the kind of, the, you know, the PI planning um, cycle, there's the IP sprint. A uh, great time to maybe do it in the IP sprint, you know, on your art or group of arts. Um, and, then, and then look back and compare. Yep. Uh, don't leave it over 12 months because if you're not doing it every 12 months, you're not getting that accurate data. And I quite like this diagram here because, you know, the assessment, you know, is, is the present, but it's giving you perhaps your objectives for where you're going to coach or where you think the organization needs to put a little bit more effort. Um, and, and you really want to be doing that at least annually um, because, you know, that's really going to set your, you know, where you're going to put your, res put your thoughts and resources. So I, I do like that model. And I do like that diagram. Um, so. Some more ways to mess it up. Do you want to um, start with the Gemba one? Maybe I'm not sure if everyone knows what a Gemba is. Yeah, certainly. This isn't 
the only way to do it, and it shouldn't be. You know, we don't just use a, a business agility survey and that's it. We should use these in conjunction with other tools. So, you know, team agility scoring low. Okay, don't just look at a number and take that as the only data point. Go see, go look. So Gemba is when we take ourselves you know, out of our data environments and go see where that problem is. So have a look at the uh, development teams, the engineering teams, you know, the factory floor, wh wherever it is, where that team is working and see for yourself. You know, does it correspond to the measure? So we want these to be, to be reinforced, to be based off, you know, quality and quantity of data points, not just is it two on an Excel spreadsheet, therefore I'm going to radically do this change. You know, we should not use these in isolation. If we do that, that sort of creates the fear that we have from doing these. And I was like, Scott, I used to hate doing these as, as a developer. So it feels like, why is someone trying to mark me? Why are they looking at me? It's, it's not about that. So make sure this isn't the only tool that you're using to drive your innovation at your organization. Yeah. And I, I mean, again, Adam and I have seen similar things bluntly driven that, um, that aren't even validated. So. I think that when I see a result, I want to understand what that means in context. Yeah. Um, I want to you know, drive into the, you know, well, why is that happening? Why is that happening? Why is that happening? Good and bad. It might be that you've got some, um, you know, some really great stories happening in the learning that nobody knows about. And the reason you're scoring continuous learning high is that there's a great initiative that's been adopted. And if you know about that in one division, you can move it to others and things. So it's not just about, you know, um, looking at the negatives, it's 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 really kind of about celebrating the successes as well. I always say, celebrate what you want to see more of. Yeah. So don't. I wouldn't even focus on the negatives. Just really getting into understanding of who's doing what right and try and replicate it, and and you'll have and you'll have you know greater results. Um, but please don't. But please don't kind of start rating people by their number and uh, and engaging with them by their you know by where they are on this because all they'll do is lie. Yeah, and, and just because you can measure something, no, don't. This isn't DevOps. We're talking about an organization here. That there's, there's people at stake. So make sure you're measuring things that are going to impact the decision making. That's really important as well. Because otherwise, we don't the third point. You know, these do have a, a psychological effect on people. If I think I'm being measured, if I think I'm being rated one to five, then how is that me as an individual, as part of this organization? Am I just a number? Am I just 30%? Am I just helping towards this? So be really careful what you measure. Only measure things that are going to matter, that are important. And try and understand, you know, some of the negative behaviors and connotations we see from this. These surveys need to be done empathetically. You know, don't force them. Don't try and bias them towards a certain result. They need to be done in an open, you know, safe forum. That's it. That's safe with a small s. <laughs> All right. Um, this is our last slide, really. We've got a thank you after it. This is, a, this is the last one. So, so I thought that's assessment. Get some feedback from you guys on it. I, I'm, as Adam says, we love the fact that they've kind of split down from something that's very complex and very safe specific into something that's, um, you know, much, much simpler. Um, we've given some advice about how that works, but where could this go in the future? Any thoughts? I would really love to get some feedback from you guys and ladies. Yep, it's now framework agnostic, so you have no excuse. I'll turn the car and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll turn the share off so we can see each other. I mean, personally, I'd like some better way of sharing this. How can we utilize big data? You know, when we're not wanting to see, this is my named bank in North America, my named bank scoring too. But how do we you know, collectively aggregate something so we can do compare and contrast? But I think that really would be vital. You know, as coaches in this sector, how are we finding things? Maybe that information already exists, just that I haven't been able to find it yet. I think someone's talking, but very, very quietly. Hang on. One second. 
Uh, I'm going to say no. Um, it might be worth just asking the group, um, do you have examples of other business agility health assessments that you currently use that, that kind of, that you rely on or use in your day-to-day -day work that could potentially be shared with the group? Okay. Am I sharing my screen? Uh, yes. Yeah, but uh, I'll, I I'll chat. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Is it talking about my lurgy today? Okay. Um, can you see the business agility report? It's got to stop there. 45,000 unread emails. You just gave me that. <laughs> I don't do emails. If somebody's, if it's important enough, somebody will call me. <laughs> you didn't give me half the time. <laughs> Apologies, Jose, for the emails you sent. Yeah. Uh, so I would really have a look at the Business Agility Institute one. It's it's where it falls down. I think is it's got too many sectors in it. So it's um, but the analysis that Agility Health have done there is is, is pretty amazing. Um, and what you can do is you can put your results in, and, and it will tell you where you are against the global. Uh, you know, and and again, it's looking at relationships, leadership, operations, individuals, and there's a, there's a there's, there's more. Um, personal stuff in there so you know a little bit more team level um but the the detail that's in here is quite good um it highlights lots of things by sector uh, this this one here for instance is different size of companies so how a big company is doing uh you know versus small companies um surprise surprise you know small companies are more agile big companies are less agile but i, I mean again this is research data based on um, you know respondents um, so, you know, I, I recommend, yeah, I highly recommend that one. Uh, the other one I recommend is, um, our lovely friend, Ben Linder. Ben's got a blog that, um, I think lists every self-assessment that's ever happened. So he's got a game that he sells, which is quite good. It's a good game. Um, but if you look here, there's, uh, these are the tools and checklists for agile self assessments. Um, and honestly, there's so many on there now that I haven't seen them all. <laughs> all right. Share, share the link. Scott. I will do. I will do. Um, and I think the business, I think the agility ones there as well. Adam, do you want to share the one to all of the health assessments and safe? Did you? Scott, um, can I ask a question? Um, yeah. Did you, um, I mean, I don't know, I, did, did you have much of an influence? It, some of these things is reminiscent of like um, Agenda Shift, which is a great um, um, survey as well. Is there, is there some sort of like parallelisms in how you would assess things with it? Or is it just how much overlap are between the two of them? Because I mean, would, would you end up like asking similar questions? That, I mean, yeah, yeah I, 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 I think we already seen this. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Mike Bowers and Agenda Shift, a very, very clever guy. I've been to some of his courses actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it is the same thing, regardless of whatever you use. Uh, you know, basically, can we get value to the customer quicker? Whichever spin, yeah. whichever orientation we put on that, ultimately, it is all about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, there may be a good, strong argument for government and NGOs where we're not sort of profit driven per se, uh, but even that is still about articulating value to an end user. But I mean, I suppose that, that's the beauty of this. We, we try different things. We see what's like, uh, what we like, what works for organization. Yeah. You know, it's not going to be a, a, a sort of one, two, three step. This fits uh, everything. We are going to have to pick and choose what goes in our agile toolbox. Has anyone on the call used anything that they particularly like and 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 the reason? And uh, whilst you're thinking about that, I'll tell you a horrible story. Uh, so I once had one client who wanted the assessment to be done on cards, a bit like Nieberg Scrum one. Um, and uh, I want Scrummers had to go and create these cards, uh, but they wanted four suites. 
So DevOps was one suite of cards. Um, agility was another one. Mm. Uh, they picked um, enterprise agility as one, and they had to think of a they had to think of another one, and they came up with um, mindset. And then they wanted to have um, so that so the forms actually taken over from the value of assessment now. So they're actually scribbling around trying to find uh, you know thirteen questions on mindset <laughs> just so they can have a pack of cards. Yeah. Good origin story. Yeah, it's, it's, so don't get caught, don't get caught up in that. Just really measure what's valuable. Um, and and again, what you measure is what you get. Can you? Yeah. Hi, Scott. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hey, yes. How are you? Okay, God. Sorry, Adam, Scott. I just changed my headset. Um, one thing that that we I think would be very useful is having a generic set of assessments. The problem is a lot of the assessments become so specific that we lose focus on it. Um, as I said, I mean, in my organization, we're huge. And the problem is with um, <laughs> just in one part of the organization, we've got in IT, we've got 7,000 people. And the challenge that we've got is we've got to balance out then how do you create such an assessment that is useful instead of and not just for the for the point of it that is i think the uh focus if we can kind of focus the question specific more specific on um uh more generic terms rather than specifics uh, obviously uh, the okr okrs are specific a very good part of that and gives it a big value but that's very dominant uh, usually from a management point of view rather than from a point of view that is from the team level yeah i mean it's always going to be traded with fidelity i mean uh, yeah. as you saw safe has gone from 22 data points to seven yeah that's always going to be the case if we do this too bespoke too niche it sort of becomes meaningless to the enterprise right it's exactly really good for that team for that program yeah as with everything it's, it's about finding that balance so is the safe business agility assessment perfect no it's not does it give us 80 percent of what we need out of the box you know what? It, it probably does and i think that's the big one isn't it jose i, I was going to say i mean i i don't have specific experience with this assessment yeah but uh, you um, i heard you at the beginning say that it's, it's quite generic questions or neutral questions yeah and the important thing about for me when you're run, running assessments like this it's it's the kind of conversations that you're what are you trying to achieve with the people that are going to be, be involved with this i wouldn't put an assessment like this in front of seven thousand people or unless you're going to be able to work with seven thousand people right yeah? So you may put it again. You you may put this in front with a a, a number of people that you're going to be able to do work with, and and you know in, in itself you start thinking, yeah, okay, but that's just only part of the organization. The organization is bigger. And that's going to be the problem, Jose. I'm always going to have this discussion. What? Why are we doing this if it's only from this aspect and not from this aspect? And this is where I'm going to end up with the biggest argument. Yeah, uh, and you yeah. know that. But the, the reality of this is that, you know, I, I, I don't know how to bring agility to companies in the thousands of people because you are you are retrofitting agility into an organization that has really, really, <laughs> Don't really... we know it? <laughs> <laughs> how to do that? I don't know how to do that in less than 15 or 20 years. Well, companies this, is the, this is the cool thing about what we've done is they've, as I said, we got rid of all our middle management. We got all of our upper management gone. We changed them to people who are specifically orientated to agile. So that means already our part of the organization is already changed in that mentality from top down. Um, decisions are made from bottom up. We have a lot of communities of practices, but at the same time, it's, this is only part of our organization. Now, if I take the 7,000 people and I put them in, into such a, a, a chapter, this is why I'm saying that there are, have to be sometimes specific OKRs or some kind of review that kind of gives something that gives a, a generic feeling throughout the that you can measure throughout the organization because they're they're the same themes. Yeah. But yeah. I was like what you said, yeah. I mean also <laughs> like you, you careful with what you measure as well and how you measure it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and like you, like I mean, I think Scott said it. I mean, you've got to be very careful, uh, not measuring just for uh, that you're measuring on a level of people because that also causes problems. 
And that's what I'm saying. It's got to be a theme based, I think, at that point in time that you're looking throughout the entire organization. Like, for instance, what level of maturity do you have currently? What level of uh, management level and so on? This is the kind of, I mean, those are generally very good. And the next question I'll get is, how do we put that into the organization as a um, centric, uh, uh, customer centric review? So <clears throat> let's, I mean, let's face it. Okay, there's been some organizations out there that we've walked into, and I'm including everyone in the call. Um, and if you put the assessment in front of them, and they would look at lean portfolio management and go, what's that? Is that, P- <laughs> Is that the PMO? <laughs> you know, um, sometimes even having a measure, you know, continuous learning. Yeah, well, you know, everyone's got a learning plan they could do per year, you know, but when you actually start drilling into the detail of having these things in place, having the time allocated, uh, do you have continuous learning with your contractors as well as your, you know, you've, you've just outsourced most of the production to a third party company. What, how are they supporting continuous learning? Is it, is it even in your outsourced contract? You know, it, so the conversations are really valuable. The measures there as a, as, as almost a prompt. Yeah. If you're and depending if you're scoring it, it's a bit like when, it's a bit like when I went to go on the scales and I look and I go, oh my goodness, goodness. I didn't know that was happening. Yeah. yeah. And being um, a Scotsman, that always happens. I, I thought, I'll, I'll be almost as a monster because I mean, this is, this, is before, this is more than 10 years ago. I was running like a questionnaire with, which was about like based on, on Gallup's Q12 and um, trying to get about stuff engagement and team, team motivations and things like that. Okay. Um, so, this is about when you're talking about the scale and what, what you're trying to do with this. Um, I was development manager. I wanted to run this with, with the development team, with all the developers and, and team that I have, 35 people in total. Right? Um, so initially, HR, huge amount of skepticism, thinking, you, you, you know, why are you going to do that? What if the results are bad? They say, well, you know, at least, ah, I, can that one. It. <laughs> at least I can do something about it. Yeah? Um, so we do it. Um, we we it was, this was part of a bigger change in how we were doing recruitment and promotions and training and retra- and re- retainment and all those things yeah um great results out of doing that lots of good learning lots of good improvements yeah company goes says oh that looks good you're looking it's looking good yeah um let's do it with 1600 people yeah so suddenly they put the assessment in front of 1600 people yeah and the problem is that there wasn't <laughs> At that level, the assessment was like, you're not going to do anything with this. It just become a um, vanity thing. Yeah. Agreed. So when you're doing assessments like this, it's like, what are you intending? What is the intent to doing this? What's the, what's the outcome and the purpose of, of doing this? At, with 35 people, we had a real, real, real ability to do something about it. 1,600 people was like, this is just pointless. Yeah. I, I was angry feeling the form. Right, so so there's multiple levels of assessment within in safe. Yeah, there's a team level one that would probably use in small teams. Yeah, that's so just looking at team agility. This one's really more for um, like small organizations to use at organization level, and larger ones to use at a divisional level. So it's it's really that you know that that large group that are working, and it's the leadership of the group that really should be looking at that. Um, and and you wouldn't. You don't send this to, yeah. This isn't an opinion piece. You don't send this to the, you know, the the four hundred people working on the, you know, one project. But as part of the, part of the improvement cycle, as as a as a team of leaders, you would use this at, at your own PI level. That's my that's my thoughts. What do you think, Adam? Um, uh, no, I I think you've uh, answered that correctly. Uh, and yes, we shouldn't be doing. Hundreds of these in a big organization, you know, tens of these and then aggregated up. Uh, and you know, they shouldn't be really bottom up, they should be sort of more top down on when doing this. You know, we have there's lots of team agility assessments, uh, SAFE has them, other frameworks have them that we can use at a team level where we can replicate, you know, in the hundreds and do something meaningful with it. You know, we shouldn't have hundreds of the results of this within one company uh, because you just get paralyzed by analysis. You know what would be really interesting? Um, 
instead of people who are in the field doing these, uh, preparing the kind of questions for the assessments, getting people in university and schools to do it. Because I hate to say, we guy, we're the older guys. We're the ones that are already doing this stuff. The, the thing that innovation is coming from, the Gen Z, it's not even there yet. Those are the thing, people that have, haven't built that framework of, of structure or stress that they've got. And they've got a more open mind. An in interesting concept, yeah. Because when you step back, if you look at all what we've learned in our school and university, we've all been built, we've created this framework and we're saying these are our limits. They are more open to those things. They're not thinking in the in the same way that we would kind of look at the restrictions on our, our, and obviously our refinements and so oh, on. Yeah. They have a more bias. open mind on it. Yeah, confirmation bias we have, all of us, yeah. And agilists have the worst confirmation bias of everything because we only see agile. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. We're here looking at our schooners thinking they're fantastic and they're thinking uh, steamships. So like that's yeah. a fair point. Because we, uh, we at Telecom are now targeting specifically school, co school kids now. We're talking about IT at school. We're doing programs specifically directly with school kids, um, open, uh, open reach hackathons with school kids and so on to get them to think outside the box. Because right now we are, we've created this box. And uh, Linda, that's a really cool. I, li I like that, that you guys are doing it as well. I mean, I think that's where we've got to start looking at this now because um, we are, we are so, I know from my point of view, okay, I've had my own British company. I live in Germany now and so on and all that stuff. I've done the scale of things and I've changed organizations and, and, and the thing is I've built my, my experience on that rather than innovation that is stuck into the, the openness about these topics. And when we look at the openness, they see things from a total different way than we could. Just going to say, um, Murray, you asked an interesting question in chat earlier. Would you like to say it out? Thanks for acknowledging. I was, I was really wondering if I was totally invisible in your chat. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Who said that? Well, I don't know. Uh, my confirmation. It's the guy on the, uh, the, guy on the, the, the mountains. <laughs> it's, my, it's, my, it's my ego that has a very low tolerance to, uh, to uh, latency. <laughs> no, I'm so... Um, uh, <laughs> Um, so the, the funny thing is, so listen, it's been a year we've been working on a whole battery of assessments of something we call enterprise agility. I know a new name, the, the, just, the, just bear with me for a second. And um, to do that, we had to build a whole model for this stuff and uh, cleaning out really. And it took 10 times longer than we thought because, you know, the model's got to be coherent, consistent, valid, validated, efficient, blah, blah, blah. So one of the barriers we come against is first, what's the purpose of this? Second, what's its use? And third, nah, I can do it myself. We're a tech team, we're developers, means we can do everything and anything because what's an assessment in the end? It's just a series of questions and some arbitrary ranking, right? So here's my question. Um, these, ex these experiences you've gathered uh, and these insights you gathered uh, on at least three assessments plus the whole infinite list that uh, Scott showed, how would you present these to, you know, t more techie teams? But I'd say, but let's not be biased. Uh, teams that have a high resistance to this stuff because they think they can do everything themselves. And also how would you um, explain the difference between um, the implementation of a, of, a, of a maturity model and the maturity model itself? Is my question making any sense? Yes, yeah. it does. Oh, I'm okay. That's surprising I'll, me. I'll, I'll have an answer and I'll let everyone else have an answer. Okay. <laughs> please, please don't give me a one sentence answer that is so simple that I have to stop. No, it, it depends. No, I'm, do, I'm actually doing a bit of work with a team like that. Okay. Tech team in uh, Eastern Europe. And um, did a couple of things. Uh, the first instance, we, we kind of we gave um, uh, like an assessment that Brandon had created to them. Uh, when the results came back, they looked a bit hinky. Uh, so we had a couple of retrospectives, and as a yeah, uh, as as someone who's experienced in agility and asking questions, um, in the questions, you know, we kind of came up with like where where the real problems are. So, so I think that's the difference between filling in a a health questionnaire in uh, Marie Claire magazine or going to the doctor. Yeah. Uh, 
you can get the team to fill in a health questionnaire on Marie Claire magazine and they'll score themselves really high and think, aren't we wonderful? But if they go to the doctor and he actually asks some probing questions, put some on the scales, look at some patterns, uh, then, then you can come up with a different thing. I use humble questioning to ask questions of them that allow them to see the gaps that they may not be seeing. Yeah, so um, humble questioning comes from um, uh, you know, Ed Shine's work. Um, so, so, and again, we talked about agenda shifts. So agenda shifts very much rooted in this as well. Ask questions, use some clean language, get people to see the, the difference. I'm using this medical model because oftentimes what coaches are, are experts in, in these things that we've spoken about, you know, flow, portfolio management, continuous learning and things like that. We can ask questions that actually get to that reality. And it may be that you have to just do that by, um, you know, by asking those questions and probing the reality and getting someone who's a little bit more expert to do it. But, but that's my view, you know, um, questions only get you so far. You need to, you need to talk to someone with a diag that can do a diagnosis, but. Um, have you, Manu, have you thought about the concepts with design thinking on this point? Um, the way yeah, they interview. We did it uh, using. Go on. Sorry. Oh, sorry, on sorry. I, I, please, please finish your 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 question. No, sorry. I was. Um, I mean, we we've kind of tried to integrate more and more design thinking into the concept of of try to target those kind of specific points because we've done questionnaires as well, and actually we do questionnaires almost every month. But to be honest, it doesn't really. I think it goes along the lines of what Scott said. Is it kind of doesn't really get to the um, heart of the problems because everybody thinks they're doing brilliantly. What we've done is um, we've taken like 10% of the people and said, okay, can we do a, a formal interview with you for like 15 minutes to get kind of, um, and, and try to shape your questions to, to understand, explore their, their pathway, why they've come to their conclusions. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's that's when you have to. It's it's all very valid, and I totally agree. Um, that's that's the approach I would take when if I was on site and had the also some some capacity to do some coaching and you have a personal relationship to the people when you do mm -hmm. maturity assessments uh, of strategic nature, and you don't want to fall into the classic trap of uh, you know just talking to management and just doing top down assessments right. that are high level because I, I don't like the fact that I, I totally agree. I can see it from their perspective the acceptance. Uh, it's going to be very low and I, I totally understand. And so that's why we try to develop sandwich. Uh, you can call them sandwich uh, maturity assessments. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, you come from the outside, you're not there. And so it's, it's a different situation. You're just there to do the assessment and sure. it's not a complete assessment. It's not an assessment of the truth or reality because you're not there with them on a daily basis. That's not what it is. It's just an mm. assessment along one model. It gives you one view, but yeah, point taken. Um, it's just not the situation we're in. Um, the statistics is the problem is it's coming from one, as you said, it's, it's coming from the eyes of the person that's seeing it rather than, than a neutral entity in that sense. And I think that's always going to be the challenge that I think all of us will always have. And it's also, um, um, I think the lack of um, understanding of what a model means, I don't know what an assessment means. What a, what a model is really without going into deep philosophical metaphysical theories of uh, system thinking and model thinking etc just what a model is and mm. um, for me intellectual humility and psychological safety are the two biggest identified barriers in doing our rounds of validation so that's ironically the things we're working on the most in the assessment have nothing to do with the assessment itself <laughs> they have to do with how, how how to introduce the assessment but yeah <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for your input. I would add a third one into that one, um, uh, Maru, and that's um, your your personal state, physical and mental. Um, so, believe it or not, they've done lots of psychological evaluations, and your ability to see color, your ability to make decisions, uh, are all really affected by how you're feeling and um, how your mental health is, and you know where you're at. And it could be that you could do the same survey two days apart in different you know one incredibly hungover maybe and one not and you get completely different results uh, i do i do talk about estimation and poker planning um and uh, 
where you know where one of the things i do kind of say is uh, you know if i give you sugar and sweets before you do estimating it's been shown that you'll estimate lower so what's going on there why if, if i can if i can affect your uh, you know you kind of your scrum estimates with uh, you know whether or not i bought you a chocolate <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. This is the, the that, that's uh, what we call the pragmatics of the assessments. That's the the confidence ranges that you have depending on the context situation. Um, I mean, in NLP, I'm um, I'm teaching NLP courses, so master level. But so one of the things that we teach them for negotiation, for example, or explaining anything, is the context, the light, and even the warmth of the drink that you give people will have a measurable influence on their memories and also how they perceive themselves and how they perceive the information you give them, including their own, uh, uh, the, the, their own history. So have you, Emmanuel, have you thought about kind of taking the same questions like at different times, the almost like a month and a half later and hitting the same audience to try to uh, scope the difference to their reactions? Yeah, let, let's measure, let's measure <laughs> Jose over winter in Finland. I'm sure by February it's going to be much more negative in his results. Well, we, we both know that something <laughs> will freeze a lot faster than they did when they were originally in the summertime, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, yeah. Stuart, that's exactly the model we're following. So that's exactly the, the philosophy of, the, of the, uh, the, the maturity journey model that we're following. Okay. That it only takes sense for a particular team and over a particular, uh, in, with a certain confidence level over a certain period of time. So right. the more you do it, the more you know your stuff, the more stable the team is, and uh, slash context. Yeah, you can, environment, you can, you can model meaningful. it better. Yeah, clearly. Yes, mm. yes, exactly. You come closer so, uh, to the reality of the team. Yeah. So, so that's the team level. What are you doing at leadership level? Because again, where Adam and I use these assessments is really to kind of almost like slap a wet fish in the leadership's face and say, look at you, you did absolutely no portfolio management. <laughs> Just, just try that in Germany, uh, Scott. Let's try that. Well, one time, let's see what happens. Yeah, wet hard dick in the face. Wow. <laughs> what the cool. All right. I'm mindful of the time, so I think it's a good moment to wrap things up. Um, yeah, just as a some finishing thoughts, I'd say, yep, yeah, really, really insightful session. Lots of food for thought. Um, thank you to Scott. Thank you to Adam. Um, we'll have the video out. Um, could be a few days. Could be a week or so. But I will post two days, a week, two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I can see the time like getting faster. Yeah, yeah, we, we like to tease. We like to tease. So, can we, can, can we retitle it like smacking, smacking leaders in the face with a wet haddock? <laughs> by the way, Scott, <laughs> I'm actually Scottish. I'm not English, by the way. I'm from Edinburgh. Cunningham is a, is a great place. It's a, a nice part of Scotland. I know. Cool. cool. Okay. So, I was going to say, yeah, subscribe. And so, where's the after party? You, and you'll get a notification when the video's out. <laughs> Um, I'll also post a link here to our next meetup next week, where we have the maestro himself, Jose Cassell, doing a session yeah. Fantastic. on metrics. Yeah, so don't miss that one. We'll talk about yeah. estimation and story points. Yeah. Excellent. Adam and I will come along to heckle. Yeah, you might, <laughs> might learn a few things. I actually <laughs> believe they would actually sit in the back. What the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Why cool. are you measuring right. anything? <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry man that's okay that's okay well yeah so yeah we're done so everyone have a good evening <laughs> hope to see you next week um thanks uh -huh. again to scott and adam also awesome. thanks not bad i, I hope, right. oh, I hope you've got pirate, me pirate metrics in there jose <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>